I'd like to uh, welcome our panelists to the stage. Uh, my name is Dan McCrum. I am editor of FT Alphaville at the Financial Times. Uh, it's the FT's blog. It's somewhat the alter right ego of okay. the FT, where we try to look at um, business, finance, technology, what is changing in the world, how it impacts um, economics, policy, and um, generally all fun things related to businesses. And we also try to puncture a little bit of hype as well. And so that brings us to AI and smart cities, the application of technology to a won the wonderful world of urban planning. I think uh, the number is about 70% of the world is expected to be living in cities in the near future. <clears throat> How do we make them better? And uh, whose version of better are we talking about anyway? How can we apply data to these problems? And um, what are the limits of attempting to do that? And how do we take the people in these cities with us? Um, we've got an ex extremely experienced and expert panel to discuss these things uh, with us today. Um, sort of representing, I guess, the city perspective, we have uh, Theo Blackwell, who is a chief information officer for the City of London. We have um, Long K. Uh, Sega Weinstein, who is uh, Chief Digital Officer for Transport for London, I guess the sort of practitioner. Uh, James Dean, who is CEO of Sensat, whose ambition, I think, is it to uh, digitize the world, um, one bit at a time, though. We won't expect you to do it all at once. And um, giving us a bit more of a, uh, I guess, the industry perspective, who are trying to sell us some of these uh, wonderful solutions. Uh, we have... Um, Will Cavendish of uh, Digital Services at Arup, but also I think you've got a bit of government experience and also deep mind for the AI <laughs> perspective. So, so I think to, um, to kick us off, I'd like to turn to Theo first, because could you perhaps set the scene for us? I, the, the Lon London has just launched its um, smart cities roadmap, I think is the right word. So uh, where are we? I mean, what should we be... What, what does a smart city agenda mean in the context of a big city like London? And what might we hope to see, say, in the near future, the sort of the next 18 months in terms of smart cities? Uh, well, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, yesterday, we launched the new roadmap uh, called A Smarter London Together. And uh, that's an update on the previous plan, smart city plan that was uh, published in 2013. And the kind of clue is in the title, really. I think what a modern city like London needs to do, to use a cliche, is to be greater than the sum of its parts. And although London is a recognized smart innovator across the world and regularly ranks up there with Singapore, which is kind of cheating because Singapore's a nation and it has lots of you know, national powers to promote the smart agenda, London um, has had a great track record on the use of open data through the data store and the work of TFL. It's been a real innovator in the number of applications that's come out of it and businesses and civic uh, benefits. But that's hidden, I think, a real challenge that we have as a city, which is we've got 32 boroughs, over 50 NHS trusts, major institutions. How do these work together to be greater than the sum of their parts. And so Smarter London Together, it, at its core, is about how we innovate in a much more collaborative way, solve problems around data sharing, and create the foundations for the application of future technologies and processes, including AI. Okay. And, and Lauren, what about you? I mean, you you're actually have been using a lot of this for a long time. And so, so where are you in terms of well, if you look at where TFL is, um, we are part of the bigger London picture, but we're also a large, complex organization ourselves. So a lot of what we had to do is think about the data that we hold and how it can be used to solve problems. And that is where I see the real sort of opportunity in terms of both thinking um, at a transport connection and helping transport uh, services run better for our customers and, and plan and operate more efficiently and better, but supporting the broader London aims of how do we support the mayor, how do we support a London growing city, um, how do we sort of think about sustainable travel and promoting that. And 
And so this is where my view is that we have to be very focused on when we're using data that we're sort of focusing on these aims. Um, we have to think about what specific problems have we just not been able to solve that really help London. And that's where I uh, work with our teams to sort of focus us and take data forward and think about solutions and problems and tools to do that. And that's, I think, really crucial about thinking about the bigger picture of connecting London and building capability and then having some sort of key challenges for us to sort of get in there and solve. And, and James, I mean, you come from a slightly different perspective, don't you, I think? Because instead of thinking about the big picture and how you solve it, you're sort of more itching to get in there and do, <laughs> do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess just to give a, a brief background on what we do, because I think we're probably the most unknown on this panel itself. Um, so Sensei, essentially, we, we talked about digitizing the world. We want to kind of essentially let computers speak to the physical world we live in to actually help us solve those problems. Um, so when we look at kind of smart cities, what that is to us is a pure tech way of essentially a digital twin. So how can we actually digitize, um, capture a lot of information in real time and actually start analyzing that to make better decisions, um, essentially at the end of the day. To do that, there's essentially three steps from our perspective. Um, so the first one is how can we actually digitize the physical geometry of what's around us? Um, essentially what we're talking about there is creating a very high resolution digital 3D map of London. Um, once we have that, we can kind of infuse real-time information. So transport data is incredibly important. Um, you know, socioeconomic information, pretty much anything we can measure digitally these days, we want to paint that environment back on. Um, and once we get to that point, we actually have sort of almost this sim city of the city which we're looking at, but on a computer screen. Um, and that's when we can really start doing some exciting things from a tech perspective when it comes to machine learning, artificial intelligence, um, all the way down to more simple things of, you know, what do we just here and there um, essentially improve the lives of citizens as well. Um, we do look at this very much from a tech perspective. I think you know, this is a beautiful panel because actually we've got um, policy and we've got people in the middle and we've got tech as well. Um, and actually this will only work as a smart city initiative if all those three parties really come together and actually collaborate and actually come together in a, in a way that actually makes sense. Um, I do think there's a lot of interesting things on the further business model which will come from this as well, but um, I'm sure we'll touch on those uh, throughout the course of the next hour or so. And uh, Will, I mean, we've got a, quite a London, London-centric uh, rest of the panel. So I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to turn to you for a bit more of a global perspective. I mean, wh where should we be looking for like where things are actually happening with smart? Cities? Yeah. What, what, are, what are the sort of the leading lights? Sure. So, so I mean, uh, um, James, you described as a beautiful panel. You know, I'll, I'll, dim, I'll demure myself from that <laughs> description. I think you know, called James Dean, you, you, you sort of probably outrank uh, on that uh, on that score. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, so look, in, in, in Arab, we think um, cities have got a little bit smarter than a decade ago, not much smarter, but a little bit more smarter. But we, we do think that, um, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning systems, you know, are going to be highly beneficial. And we've got a bunch of them, you know, stuff already underway. We do remote, you know, asset inspections and we do, um, you know, real time uh, infrastructure improvements and we do flood management and wastewater interventions using artificial intelligence. And I think, I think a couple of weeks ago, we did something quite exciting, which was the first ever 3D printed house entirely built by robotics. So, you know, we're, we're believers in this stuff. We think, we think it could make a big difference. But two things. One is that the UK is at risk of falling behind. Um, you know, when, when I look across, our, our, you know, across the cities of the world, including our client base, um, there are cities to a degree in North America, but more in East Asia, which are doing much more of this and much more quickly. Um, and if we're going to really, really, in the UK, take advantage of this, we're going to need bigger programs of digitization, bigger programs in the world of data that underpin all of this, as just been described earlier. And secondly, I think we've got to stop talking about smart cities and AI and talk about better cities and think about what is it that we're trying to deliver for citizens? What do citizens want? They want better jobs. They want better places to live. They want it to be empowered. They want a sense of control. And we need to be thinking about and designing smart cities and AI in a way that I think fundamentally sits with the values and the ambitions of our cities and our people, rather than a kind of technocratic ex exercise, let alone one that is that are monopolized by a small number of tech companies. So I think there's a, you know, there's a great potential, but I think there are some big challenges in there that, that, that's going to be have to need to be cracked in the UK if the real benefit of this is going to accrue to our citizens, to our people. Mm. And, and I think, I mean, I touched on this earlier. I mean, but what do you mean by better? Because th there's lots of different ways that we could define better, isn't there? This is getting a bit W1A, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and, you know, I'm thinking Theo's title should be director of better in, in, <laughs> in you know, in, in London. What do we mean by better? Well, that's, that's, that's what's, that is what democracy is about, isn't it? it mm. It's what, what do people want in their cities? Generally speaking, people want cities that are livable, 
where they can earn a decent living. They've got housing that they can afford and can, and can live in. They want services that work around them, but also they want a culture um, that they feel at ease with, and they, and, and, and they want a sense of empowerment and control and in, in engagement in their lives. And that is a version of what our cities should be and could look like, where you know, smart technologies and artificial intelligence could play an enormous role, but only if they're designed in, in that way. And at the moment, you've got you know, one extreme, what's that exactly extreme, you know, the Barcelona movement and around decode and things like that, which is pushing really hard to put citizens in charge. At the other extreme, you've got you know, a large technology company of sort of you know, Chinese origin that is sort of running all of the traffic lights in, in Huangzhou and doing it in a way that's not exactly open to scrutiny or, or, or um, control. And those are very, very, very different models that are emerging. So I think that's something that, that we should start really talking about more, more practically about, about how we do this and how it really meets the needs of our citizens. I, I was just going to say as well, I think it's a really interesting question, what is better? Um, we actually, a, a couple of weeks ago, sat down and did a brainstorm as a team. So I think about, about 10 of us actually kind of did this exercise. And we all wrote down what it was important to us. Uh, so some people said, you know, someone's peddling drugs at the end of this road, so he wants better crime um, statistics so he can inform where he goes. Um, I care about air pollution for health statistics. Some people care about transport. Um, and we didn't come to a consensus. But actually, between all of us, we found that everyone wanted something different. So then we kind of said, okay, let's look at the other way. Let's try and figure out how we sell this thing. So we said, actually, at the end of the day, the ultimate person that everyone needs to sell to here is a citizen, um, be it a private company trying to offer a service such as um, you know, a, a transport app which tells you when your bus is coming to benefit the citizen right the way through to government trying to design policy. Because at the end of the day, that's really who matters. Mm -hmm. um, I do think there's a lot of complexity in that question, though, because we didn't come to consensus with that, um, which actually means it's quite difficult if you're kind of taking macro ideas and trying to apply business models within that as well. Um, so I, I feel a little bit sorry for you guys <laughs> to have to figure that out, but also um, incredibly envious of good problems to solve as well. Well, let, let's get a bit into then what we can do with the data and where we can bring it in and the problems we can solve. Because, um, Thea, I wanted to come back to you on artificial intelligence as well. Because mm. I thought the London, the London plan just published is very interesting. It's got all these sort of bold ambitions and you know, commendable for trying. It seems there's a lot of focus on getting people involved. It may be just me, but I don't remember seeing the words artificial intelligence in it. Oh, yeah, no, they, they do appear. Uh, but we talk more about data uh, for artificial artificial intelligence to really succeed, it needs high volumes of high quality information to learn from. Mm -hmm. um, so if we get to a point where AI is applied to public services, and there are examples of, uh, you know, sort of uh, attempts and pilots being made uh, in parts of public services, what we need to do is set the foundations. At the moment, although we uh, as a city have, I think, excelled in the provision of open data in certain areas, that's sort of really the tip of the, the iceberg, right at the top. We need to do the hard yards here on things like data sharing, find out the full, have full knowledge of our technology estate um, that, public service, that serve public services that has grown over the last 15 or 20 years, last 10 years maybe. Um, I don't think we've got full knowledge of that yet, and that means we don't have full knowledge of the data that we hold, whether it's computable or indeed what its vulnerabilities are. And I think as uh, city government, this is now core business for us, and city government in a, in a big global technology city, this has got to be so sorting out the foundations and having confidence in those foundations has got to be sort of priority number one for us. So um, what you'll see from our approach is actually looking at those foundations, perhaps shying away from, from the bolder statements made about smart cities. Uh, because I think some of those bolder statements made at the beginning of the decade haven't really come mm. to fruition. There's a really interesting piece of research by Arup and Future Cities Catapult that essentially saying that smart cities haven't taken off because lack senior leadership, they're not put in strategic plans, uh, they're usually side innovation pots. There's not a lot of collaboration with citizens. Uh, and the relationship with the private sector isn't very clear. Now, you could probably say that about most organizations <laughs> going through digital transformation, let alone cities. But those are the things that we need to get right. And interestingly enough, to a greater or lesser degree, when we talk to the people of London and tech experts and so on, that's what they said to us. So ours, uh, our approach is taking a step back and say, 
hang on a second, let's get those foundations right. And I think in terms of using the data, I mean, look, you've got, TFL has got a lot of experience. I mean, it has a huge amount of data. I mean, what are some of the examples of where you've actually been able to sort of pull data and use that effectively? So I think particularly at a time where we have to work together to set the foundations, we need to also sort of show the potential and be sort of think about innovation and think about trialing some new ways of looking at questions and, and solving some of the problems. And so what we've been doing is thinking about how do you do that. So we have lots of ticketing data, for example. Um, and we have so 19 million transactions every day through our ticketing system. Um, we have bus vehicle data, and we have to think about how do we how do we sort of get the foundations right? And there's a lot of work to do that. Um, and then, of course, when you think about complementing it with other data sets and governance and the like. But at least if we can sort of show some impact, it's crucial. So one of the things that we've done is we've sort of taken the sort of the, the data from our ticketing system and our bus systems, which is where our buses are, and combined it together so that we can sort of have an understanding and a picture across sort of the public transport network, network of where uh, travel patterns are. So building a sort of a pattern tool uh, that looks at sort of aggregated up um, sort of travel patterns helps us sort of plan better services. So this is all about how do you design an outcome um, using data. And this is where we can sort of look at sort of pro uh, the provision of sort of routes and services and even at a very local level, how do you make sure the city services work? So we've looked at some of our junctions where we've had to sort of rebuild and redesign them. And you'll see um, over the years, you've seen places where you you've had to sort of highway in Islington, for example, redesign the way that sort of the road works. And at the same time, we've had a thought about could we make better sort of bus services. And this is, this is a real benefit at a, at a transport um, level of joining up the data and being able to sort of say it's not just sort of running, um, running a bus in a particular sort of area at a particular time, but how do you understand the people that are consuming the services? And I think that is a sort of a small example of what we need to do in terms of thinking about how do you link it up to the city? I mean, we know people are not traveling um, just as a sake of traveling, so how do we understand overall sort of service patterns? And then how do we understand um, people who are walking and cycling on the network where today, frankly, we don't have a lot of information about how they right. travel? And car drivers, and how do you use this to really understand and design services that work for our sort of con so the, the citizens of, of London? And that's sort of key. But I think it comes down to um, this sort of this grand level of ambition and then sort of saying, is there a particular question? Like we did looking at um, Wi-Fi um, data connection where we took a pilot and we took anonymized um, sort of information from devices on our network and we could look at how crowded a train was or how busy a corridor was on a tube station. And all these sort of little things you do to sort of understand what can be done with data. And then you have to say, the, so what are we going to do with it? How are we going to make the system work? How are we going to make our services work better. What, what do you actually do with that data when you find it, though? Because I think the Wi-Fi mm. example was really interesting. Yeah. Sort of, you were tracking for four weeks a whole sort of all the passengers in certain stations through their phones but, logging onto the Wi-Fi system. So what we did is we sort of set out a four-week uh, sort of pilot where we sort of took, uh, we basically pseudonymized sort of device data. And which essentially we had people, if they had a Wi-Fi uh, within a station, and we told people about it because it was crucial that we were transparent about what we were doing, um, we said, we are looking at patterns on the network. We're not looking at, we weren't actually tracking because that sort of uh, <laughs> talks about sort of a, a tracking an individual. We were looking at patterns to see how, uh, how travel was on the network and say, is it useful? And one of the things that we were trying to do with this test was to say, could this be something that a line controller, someone who's running the Piccadilly line or the Victoria line, would they find this information useful? Um, because right now they uh, have to make decisions based on their eyes and CCTV cameras and what's, what happened yesterday and last week. Is there an opportunity for AI, uh, for data, to really help as a decision support to be able to sort of say, we predict this is what's going to happen um, if, this hap if this sort of happens and if this condition is happening now? And so 
what we found is through sort of that data exercise that we were able to sort of convince ourselves there's, there's value and merit of exploring this further. And then the aim is in this sort of learning an iterative model, um, you think about how you might build up um, a next step and a uh, tooling that could be used to tell our customers what's happening on the network and giving them more sophisticated and more helpful advice um, about what's happening on the network and predicting, which is um, much more complicated than just reporting what's happening now. People want to know what's likely to happen and what they should therefore do. Well, that, I mean, that's a good example of how you can use it where you have all the data. But James, I think you, you I mean, when it, when it comes to buses, I think you've experienced attempting to get data with possibly less success. Right, so a, a bit of background. So we, we were incredibly frustrated towards the end of last year because we felt smart cities was being talked about a lot, but actually not a lot was being done about it. Um, or actually, maybe phrase that slightly different, a lot of impact was not being felt by citizens at the end of the day. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why that is. But we kind of wanted to kind of break it down to kind of its core tech constituents and say, actually, can we set ourselves a challenge of building a smart city? Um, so we decided to have a go at building a smart Cambridge. Um, Probably not the best place to start uh, if you kind of measure Cambridge by some metrics. It's already pretty smart. Um, but <laughs> we kind of thought we would start there. Um, and we basically said, like, can we do this in, in a week? Um, so what we did is we went and digitized Cambridge. We built a digital replica of about 900 million data points. Um, so actually the highest resolution digital copy of Cambridge. That was the canvas. Um, the next element was to go and actually put about 500 sensors around the city. Um, so these were proprietary data sensors. They were giving us environmental information, you know, humidity, temperature, not particularly exciting, um, crowd sensing. Um, and then the third element was to get open data. So um, Telefonica contributed a lot of data in terms of where the people patterns were and where people were in the city at certain times of day. Um, and then the city council gave us a lot of data as well. Um, there was one kind of interesting lesson that came out of this was one of the data sets the council provided was bus data. Um, so here in London, TfL's bus data is, is phenomenal. You know, people have built apps which have built businesses off the back of it. We all feel the benefit as customers. Um, but when you kind of take those models and put it into cities which aren't as big or maybe sophisticated, you kind of start to see some problems. Um, so we had 750,000 data points per day on buses. We thought, this is, this is fantastic. Um, and then we started looking at it. And actually what we realized is about 98% of those data points were actually not in Cambridge itself. Um, so when you're trying to build a smart Cambridge and you've got a lot of data, you don't want that much redundant data. It's kind of... Um, it's a bit of a headache. Um, and then we had to look a little bit further, and we found um, not only were some of those buses outside of Cambridge, but we found a couple in the Mid-Atlantic, um, some in South America. And, and it kind of answers probably more questions than it raises in some circumstances. But um, it really raises a serious question of how much can we trust the data we're having here? Right. How well indexed is it? How transparent is it? Um, and really kind of taught us that for smart cities to work, the data has to be open data that's accessible. Um, but also there's a massive opportunity for a company to come and standardize and index this data and actually provide it in a way which is systematic, um, which has been done in larger cities in certain areas, um, but not universally, and especially not in, in smaller cities where the data is less frequent as well. Um, I do think it's a nice opportunity to start fresh, though, in a lot of cases. Yeah. So I think there's an opportunity here, right? Because um, when, you, when you look at the sort of the data industry, you have, you'll have sort of some people who are some very narrow focus that says, we want really good data quality, and sometimes they struggle to say why. And there's a sort of, sometimes I've seen this evangelism um, among some sort of particularly technical people who say, well, it just, it just has to be there. And I think some of this has got to be how do we as sort of uh, practitioners and as policy advisors and as techies say, right, yes, we need, when, when does it need to be good and why does it need to be good? Because I worry that if we just say, well, data needs to be perfect, I mean, first of all, it's far from that, but I think, yeah. I think you've made a really good example that says, here's why it's been a problem that you haven't been looking after the data. Um, and so I think working amongst ourselves, it's a good opportunity for us to sort of say, where do we prioritize getting that good data and for why? Because I think that's really where you'll begin to see us make progress against these big challenges of all these different disparate data sets that have a range of, of stuff, some good, some not so good. And one of the things that we've, we launched yesterday is, is an institution, new institution for London called the London Office for Data Analytics. And that is basically from, from a list, an initial list of about two or three, I think 250 um, data sets that we have in common with other public authorities, we're gonna come up with the best data sets or the data that is the most accurate mm. and find what we can do with that or set questions and see what data we have in order to answer for them. In order to, in order to do that, we need to think about standards, we need to think about approaches, but we're not doing it alone 
as city government. We're doing it with universities and we're doing it with industry. And that's like people in a room really interrogating how that data came about and what we can do with it. This is the beginning of a much, much larger operation. But we've got to start somewhere and we've got to develop our approach. And, uh, and this is like fantastic to hear because I think one of the key findings for us was that we weren't being scientists about smart cities. We were trying to fix little right. solutions um, where we had independent problems. And actually what we need to do is be scientists, get the data, and it will never be perfect as, as good as we can and work about how we can actually through that experiment have the best data. Um, and then start listening to that data to find the problems before we then come and solve them. Um, it seems like fragmented and actually the approach to date has been much the opposite. Um, and to kind of hear this is, is kind of really kind of music to our ears um, collectively. And I think from industry, it's also good to have like the industry, sorry, well, I'll just add the point. Um, it's really good to have the industry perspective of people with fresh eyes coming in saying, hey, did you notice you have the bus in the Atlantic Ocean? And some of the stuff that if you're very close to this for a long time, you will you know, just be sort of not necessarily picking up on this. So in addition to systematic tools that you're building, how do you have the fresh perspective from a, from a new way of thinking from it? And, well, no, Will, I wanted to bring you back in because, as well, I'm interested in sort of what are the good examples of open data where it, you are actually getting data which is producing, you know, systems which are working, improvements, better things. But also, is it just open data or are there other limits to, you know? So, so, so I think the, the, the reason why so much has um, happened in, I mean, so much of what we call smart cities is actually better transport cities. And that's, you know, that's because actually transport have taken the lead and those are the areas where data have been easier to get and so on. And, for, and, and all credit to folk who've driven that forward. It's, it's been absolutely, you know, absolutely fantastic. But there are big areas where data is still an enormous rate limiting factor. Energy, for example, we, we know from all kinds of um, individual uh, pieces of work that we could, we could hugely improve the energy efficiency and energy utilizations in our cities, if we had the kinds of connected data that are being described, the data registries, the data interoperability that allow us to work. Just a very small example of that was when I was at DeepMind, where we did that for one data center in Google, which generated 15% you know, reduction in energy use instantly through the use of a, of a better algorithm rather than you know, human engineering wisdom. And you just think if that was replicated, and I'm sure it could be across, across scale, that would be enormous. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, there's a big push there, and likewise on, on simulated cities. So you know, it's great to hear what you're doing, James. As, as you'll know, there are other cities around the world that have already done this. I mean, Toronto is obviously an example, Singapore, another example, a, a number of the Chinese places. That's moving really fast. And again, one of my concerns is whether we're moving fast enough to have those sort of data tools and those simulations um, with us, you know, in, in order to improve uh, the environment for people here. But just one final point, if I can, around equally the, the importance of not just thinking kind of left to right, but right to left. So we did, a, we did a, like, an amazing piece of work. It wasn't amazing from an Arab point of view, but from the client point of view, with, with, an, with a sort of area in Denmark which really wanted to um, you know, develop all the stuff around smart and intelligent places and so on. But the thing they wanted to do was to reconnect people with nature. So they set us this really difficult thing of how do you, how do, you do intelligent city without the smartphone? It's like your, your brain melts, right? You think, well, that's just... And you realize that actually so many of our vision of smart city is constantly checking apps on a mobile phone. They we don't want that. We want people in this area to feel connected with the environment, with the natural habitat, with the real world. So we had to develop these ideas for kind of invisible technology and magic technology, which goes to this point of the, the vision of what we're trying to achieve. So we should be thinking hard about where we build out from where we are now, but, but equally in our city governments and our... And actually, across the piece, we should be thinking, where are we trying to drive to? What, what world are we trying to create? Mm -hmm. Mobility is a service. The, the, the ARC folk who do this sort of great work on un, you know, unpicking economics have suggested that mobility as a service will cost half of what current transport costs. That op opens up opportunities for inclusion of older people in our cities in a way that is actually quite difficult at the moment. What a brilliant thing to start thinking about now and planning into the way we design and build, build our cities. So there's a bunch of stuff that we can do now. There's a bunch of stuff that's a bit more visionary, but I think we should be trying to really figure out what those gains can be and start building toward them now. I think the, um, I mean, just picking up on your earlier point about utilities, I think there's a particular challenge in the UK about how we derive data from energy companies and water utilities and so on. I, I don't think that the, um, you know, great architects of the privatization in the 1980s really thought that in 30 years' time people might say, how do we integrate data systems from this? And, um, and I think that differs perhaps from other cities 
uh, in the world where there may well be a different relationship with who runs your water system and who runs your energy system. So I think there's a particular challenge on the regulated utilities uh, to do that. Now, I think the next challenge, I mean, TfL's been doing pilots with mobile phone data on the tube and also like how you tell citizens about that, which is a really interesting thing, working with the Information Commissioner's Office. I think it's a really, really good example of transparency uh, in, uh, at a time when people are questioning these things. But I think the next thing that sort of comes along for our cities is we are about to embark on a you know, quite an active uh, process, well, quite, well, quite an active approach to using planning powers to enhance the connectivity of our city. The Smart London Together plan uh, talks about enabling access to rooftops, to increase choice for mobile phone connectivity. We'll have a whole new generation, in a couple of years' time, we'll be a whole new generation of smart lampposts. Today, we've put through a pilot on 5G. The role of mobile phone companies and the trade-off of data that they hold with civic goods is actually going to be a really important thing. And the question you know, that, that kind of runs around my mind sometimes is that we are enabling the digital economy by uh, creating a more liberal climate for the production the, or the installation of the means to do this, but are we actually capturing the right trade-off with the citizen? Will we be buying that data? to enhance TfL in the future? Are we striking the right deal? And I think city governments, not just in London, but right across the world, have to be alive to uh, those the, the dimensions of that trade-off, because this data could be incredibly useful to us. I think we mentioned inclusivity there as well. I mean, and, and there's this question that isn't there in terms of not everyone in the city has a smartphone. You know, there are large sections of the population who there's a danger of they get left behind by some of this, or that you know, as you collect data, you're collecting a sort of a biased set of data because you know, if you're using smartphones to do it, you're missing all the people who don't use those. I mean, so how I'd be interested how you're thinking about those aspects of of what you're doing and and how you keep that in close, inclusive, or you would adjust those biases. I mean, Lauren, you're you're nodding or. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk and then I can... Uh, I forgot what I was going to say, actually. Okay. Well, so I, I think this is a really important question, and I think we do need to be mindful um, of the sort of whole spectrum um, of society and making sure that we are very thoughtful about the solutions that we're putting in. Um, and this is why, I mean, I've, I've spent some time, uh, a lot of time yesterday on the ethics uh, stage, and it was, it's really, I think, we are beginning to think about how do we sort of bring in ethics as we sort of design and develop um, the sort of tools going forward. So I think it's fundamental. Um, in terms of sort of what you do, I think the first step is really being mindful of the biases, but we've been biased, we've had either limited or biased data Always. So there's beforehand we were looking at sort of paper surveys to sort of do designs on one day, uh, one typical day in say November and a year, and and that would be very old data five years ago. So some of this is about can we use new techniques and new data sources, understanding that we need to control and try and do as best we can to sort of be as comprehensive or at least know where the biases are um, to design services and then do a feedback loop, right, to make sure that when we do this, that we are mindful that we do have a gap and a bias and that if we're providing a service that is either digitally based to our customers, there's another option, um, or if we're designing sort of, um, uh, sort of fundamental ways of transport provision that we're really thoughtful to make sure that we're not, we're not getting it wrong and that we're not sort of um, sort of replicating uh, sort of a bias that we sort of set into the system. If, if, I, if I go to the doctors and they want to know my heart rate, they don't put the stethoscope on my knee. They know where to put that to listen to my heart rate. And I think that's actually very adaptive to cities is we don't really know how to listen to the cities to truly measure what we want to know at the moment. Um, so, for example, you can also include biases which aren't particularly who has a smartphone, et cetera, but it might be if we want to measure air pollution, um, where do we place that sensor? If we place it on top of a lamppost, we're going to get a completely different reading to the bottom of a lamppost. Um, so there really is this massive kind of scientific advocacy that kind of needs to go into this. Um, I, I, I guess that this will be in, in the London plan, but um, I, what I'd like to see is almost some sort of 
um, grading system of data where actually people can contribute data and you know it's a certain grade, which will probably be statistically based in terms of we, we can um, verify that. So, you know, if we go on the building market, we're going to buy a certain type of steel or a certain type of wood. It comes with a specific grade, so we know what we're purchasing. Um, similarly with data, and I think that's a good way of also introducing kind of a way to value that data as well. Mm. Um, so it actually becomes a commodity market as well, which is... So I, I, I wanted to say something a little bit different. I, I, think, I think this question is a really important one, and I think when, when, when we look at cities around the world, the, the ones who are really at the, at the sort of frontier are bringing together regeneration, the smart city, the green city, the child-friendly city, in in one place together. And that's, that's I think, you know, a way to go in this, in this way, to, to, try and, to try and put this agenda, not just a kind of technical agenda, but something more deep about what sort of cities we want to live in and how we make those cities equitable, fair, and places of prosperity for everyone. And there are some great developments. They're not, it's not easy to do, but there are a lot of developments around the world, and some in London as well, which are, which are trying to do this. And I think that's some of the most exciting work. Where you're, where you're using technology not as an end in itself, but as something which is an underpinning to a broader vision of prosperity and inclusion you know, with, within, within cities. And cities are a great place to do that. That's what they are. That's what they started out as. That's what they can be. So I think powerfully bringing those agendas together is, is, is a way of trying to take, tackle that problem and get technology behind some of our deeper challenges. Well, we've, um, we've proposed, again, using planning powers, planning powers of pretty much the strongest lever that the mayor of London has. So we've looked at, we, we know that there's going to be quite a lot of development in London. We know the population is going to go up in the, by a million, I think, in the next uh, 20 years or so. Um, I think someone calculated that as two train loads into London every week yeah. or something like that, and people not leaving. So London's going to grow as a city. Um, we have major areas of regeneration, Rotherhive and um, some of the, uh, uh, the development companies that are around uh, London. We have an opportunity here to set standards for uh, internet things and sensors in order to ensure that the data that we collect is of a certain quality, um, if, if appropriate, it doesn't have vulnerabilities, and can, if negotiated properly, work towards the, uh, the public good. And I think that's really important. And that's one of the new things that we've done with Smarter London together was the role of planning powers in actually facilitating this. Well, that's terrific. Thank you for that, Thea. And thank you for um, Lauren, James, and Will. That was uh, terrific. I think we've laid out the opportunities and how we want to get there, if not necessarily where we're going to go. But thank you very much. And thank you all for listening.